Welcome to the DivorceBuddy.co's Kids First Podcast. DivorceBuddy.co's Kids First Podcast focuses on children. We share strategies on collaboration, communication, conflict resolution, staying out of court when at all possible, and of course, putting kids first. Our guests are high integrity, divorce and relationship professionals who are thought leaders and visionaries in the field. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Jeremy Cawson. So on today's broadcast, we're doing something a little bit differently, working with Sarah Free. Her topic is how to work on your marriage when your marriage no longer works. So this is a little bit different. This is generally a divorce-themed podcast, but today we're really excited to have Sarah Free working with people that think they've gotten to the end, but has helped so many people save their marriages. Sarah has a really interesting story. She knows firsthand really how difficult life can be when the real life doesn't turn out the way you thought it would be, whether that means divorce or a struggling marriage. She really employs employs proven methods and techniques to help individuals and couples who are grappling with everything from should I get a divorce to help me save my marriage or even starting anew if all those efforts for salvaging your marriage have failed. Sarah draws on her years of both personal and professional experience to really help you get the most from your relationship, how to survive conflict and how to thrive in the face of adversity. I'm really excited to have Sarah on the show. So with no further ado, welcome to Sarah Freak. We're thrilled to have you on the broadcast today. Thank you, Jeremy. Now, first off, can you share with us a little bit about what you do and the people that you help? I'm a certified marriage coach. I educate people either in a premarital stage or in a marriage already on what having a great and everlasting marriage entails. And the methods I teach are simple, enabling anyone to learn and implement them. And you know, why do you do what you do specifically? And you know, what inspired you to go into this field of work? I believe that most marriages in crisis today can be saved from divorce. And I also believe that the reason for the growing divorce rate is that there's a result of, it's because of a lack of education as to what being married actually entails. So if adults would invest the time and effort to acquire the knowledge of what makes for a good, happy, and everlasting marriage, the divorce rate would be significantly reduced. And as Michelle Wiener Davis terms it in her Divorce Busting Methods, Whoever said that marriage doesn't come with instructions? Well, it does, and everyone can learn them. Learning it and practicing it will result in an harmonious marriage, and I like to share my insight based on my own experience. My first marriage of 10 years, which resulted in three beautiful children, unfortunately ended up in divorce, primarily due to the fact that my then-husband strayed from our Orthodox Jewish religious path. And we as adults and parents must strive to provide stability on all levels to our children, including the religious values, regardless of which religion we're practicing. So the parent deciding to change must respect that the children and the spouse can't be expected to be forced to change in accordance as well. Had I had the relationship insight and education I have today, I could have lovingly encouraged him to reconsider and thus avoid so much anguish and pain to all involved, specifically the children, and saving my marriage. No, that's excellent. And I like what you said in terms of it's universal, whether it doesn't really matter what you know, faith or background that you come from. It's, these are, it's a universal theme. Exactly. Definitely. It does not matter which religion you're practicing. It is a universal thing. Can you describe the foundation of a healthy marriage and in particular how a couple can best rebuild a strong foundation, particularly after some significant strife? That's a very good question, and actually it's a two-part question. Regarding a healthy marriage foundation, it boils down to some basic principles. I can list about 10 of them, uh, which are crucial. Maybe I'll go into one or two in detail and then list the rest. One of the first things is you need to know each other. Be tuned in. Knowledge is power. We need to invest the time frequently enough to be curious and ask each other things with regards to the likes, the dislikes, hobbies, sensitivities history about each other, our thoughts, the wishes, etc. And this enables spouses to know how to support the good things, the dreams within one another, and how to avoid hurting each other, knowing the, the sensitivities or history thereof. Another benefit of knowing each other is it helps to keep connection 
alive and having what to talk about aside to the day-to-day going on. So people often ask, so how do we do this? There are many ways to do this. Number one, you can come up with your own questions. The other thing is, luckily today, many thought leaders have developed games for helping couples come up with the right questions and digging deep into each other's history, etc. I do have a, a link on my own website, resources store under the resources store tab. And the Gottmans, for example, have a game called, it's called the Gottmans Couples Retreat Board Game, which includes very good questions, open-ended questions, love map questions, etc. So there are many ways to do this, but knowing each other is very important. Another one on the list is appreciations and admirations. Express what you're grateful for. Don't allow your ego to get in the way, meaning many people are too proud to let their partner be aware and know how much better off they are because of their spouse. That's a shame. Everyone has a need to feel valued. The benefit of sharing appreciations and admirations is that your spouse will be encouraged to do more of what you admire and what you need. So that's a gain for you right there. The other aspect is it helps to keep you in a positive perspective versus being conscious or negative all the time about the relationship. And we need to be consciously positive in order to be happy. Let me quickly list the other eight, not going into detail. Character refinement, caring behaviors, connection, managing marriage conflict, making each other's life dreams come true, developing and maintaining shared meanings, trust and commitment. Now, with regards to how to rebuild after marriage has gone through a lot of strife, number one, commit. Commit to doing the work by learning and practicing the newly learned methods. Another big one is you need to seal your exits. Let me explain that a bit. Don't discuss your issues with others. You know, we tend to speak to our friends, our family, our neighbors, everybody and anybody, but they can't really help you. So keep it within working with a professional. And Another exit is don't seclude yourself and keep yourself overly busy by avoiding your spouse because what you're really trying to do is connect. So that's another exit of you know, something not to do. Another important thing is persevere. It took time to develop the bad habits and wrong behaviors, and it will take time to replace it with the new and better ways. It gets easier and becomes habitual, but it does take time. And something else is forgiveness. Many people ask, can I ever forgive or will he or she ever forgive? It will happen. It will take time. It will happen. You'll get there. Time heals, but beyond there are other elements in terms of accelerating forgiveness or just, or just being patient. How do, we, how do we forgive? Well, the first thing is when we listen to what actually brought about a certain behavior. For example, I'll take an affair, affair situation. Normally, I tell couples that although there is no excuse for it, I do find more often than not that sometimes someone is sexually addicted and comes into the marriage with those habits. So that is a problem. But more often than not, when the spouse that cheated perpetuates that behavior or it's a new behavior, something new that has happened to the, to the spouse in terms of having an affair, it's because of dissatisfaction in a marriage. And if we're dissatisfied in a marriage... The spouse must not be fulfilling certain needs for the other one. So when I say forgiveness takes time, that's because it takes time to dig into why something happened. And knowledge, I'll go back to the knowledge is power, knowing the reasons and then sometimes taking a certain aspect of responsibility for oneself in terms of what they contributed to allow the space to happen and thus allowing someone to have an affair, not by actually allowing, but because, you know, there was something wrong in the relationship, definitely brings forth forgiveness. But that, again, takes time. And if you could just clarify when you said the spouse or the partner is not fulfilling, not necessarily that the relationship's not being fulfilled. What I'm saying is not, it's not the responsibility of the spouse because we're each responsible for our own behavior, but we all contribute to strife and we all contribute to problems as much as we don't want to take a look at ourselves. So one of the things I do in therapy is when we, when we explore what is your contribution to the problem, it's usually an eye opener for, for the client when they realize that yes, my spouse has strayed, but perhaps I was busying myself with everything and anything else other than giving my spouse the attention my spouse needed and frequently asked for, but I really didn't take it seriously. That's what I mean by the contribution. Not that you're to blame, but there might be something that you've done to contribute to the problem. So how can we fix that? And thus forgiveness comes forth when you realize that it's not 100% blame. Exactly. And and that's why that takes time. 
No, that makes perfect sense. That's what I thought you meant. And we don't get anywhere just playing the blame. Exactly. Or, or exactly. The blame game. Taking our and, and time does heal when you when you find the new fi- found tools and ways and you begin to develop the connection and, and you begin to behave in better ways. You forgive with time. You you able to ask for forgiveness and able to receive to, to actually forgive, but that does take the time. Now what what sort of process do you follow? Like how do you do what you do? So normally when one of the spouses contact me, it can be either the husband or wife in the in the marriage. Um what I do is I have an initial uh, consultation just to discover if indeed we're fit. And when I actually meet with a client on the onset, I help them achieve clarity as to the current state in their marriage. So basically discovering their contribution to the problems and hand their spouses from their perspective, of course, and any external factors. The way I accomplish this is by specific coaching tools, which I attained from training with the CDC Divorce Coaching based in Florida. The other thing I do is when the client is seriously considering divorce and they're seeing divorce as the only option, we walk down both paths, meaning we walk down the path of saving the marriage and what that would look like. Uh, We analyze all the different aspects in detail. And we walk down the path of what divorce would look like and analyzing all the different aspects they need to take into consideration as well. And the way we do that is utilizing powerful questioning techniques, which are very thought-provoking. And this, this really results in broadening the client's perspective. And we always have the client discover new possibilities that they haven't even thought about before. When we actually continue working, say the client decides, I'll take the instance of saving the marriage. I utilize different marriage modalities and marriage therapy modalities. One of them is the Gottman modality. And I also often inflect Imago and a lot of Michelle Wiener's voice busting methods as well. And how do you, you articulate your belief on how you do what you're doing? How do you bring your vision to life? Firstly, I see clients individually or as a couple. So by doing one-on-one marriage coaching, I'm able to really salvage many marriages. And I get clients via word of mouth, through social media, etc. The other thing I do, which I like to actually preempt that and say that I love doing premarital coaching because, again, I'm very, very strong on the fact that the reason there are so many failing marriages is because of the lack of education as to what a good marriage entails. So premarital coaching is really uh, getting the couples to recognize and know what makes for good marriages and gaining a real understanding of utilizing those tools and methods. I'm trained in conducting workshops in the Gottman Seven Principles for what makes for a good marriage. And of course, I also do workshops for couples who are in the process of divorce, particularly on handling the children well and and keeping them safe, sheltering them from any unnecessary strife in the process. Sarah, what would you say are the two or three greatest misconceptions and realities parents should understand regarding the impact of divorce on their children? I love this question because this speaks uh, very closely to my heart, given what I have realized was happening with my own children. I think the main misconception people have is there's this common saying, children are resilient. I mean, when you think of what resilience means in plain definition, simple definition, it's the capacity to recover quickly. But when we think about it, are the children indeed recovering quickly? Their, their home is undone. Their, they have to begin, you know, uh, shifting between two different homes, sometimes even more if they're going around different grandparents' homes, etc., and so many other changes that are happening in their life. So I believe uh, it's an insult to children to say that they're resilient. I, I think the more accurate thing to say is that they are conforming to the new reality, but uh, they don't really recover from the undoing of their home. The other misconception is the fact that parents think that they will know when something is off and wrong with their child and they'll be able to be the good support for their child throughout the process. In truth, the children have usually, children are witness to the parents not being able to handle their emotions or obviously emotions between the two the two parents. So there's a lot of conflict that they witness. And the, the child loses the trust in the parent being the one to turn to. And so that becomes another problem. And then there's the common thought of, you know, my children will be no less better off than everybody else who is not impacted by divorce. I believe strongly that that is not true. The children have experienced the trauma. Divorce is a trauma. And of course, trauma has an effect. And therefore, your child will carry a burden 
which the peer, their peers are not carrying, the peers of non-divorced homes. So I, I think adults and parents should be aware of those misconceptions. You made some great points, and especially like far as resiliency, outwardly, there may be the appearance of resiliency, but we know that most, you know, so many different things that we have are issues in relationships later in life and, and other issues can be traced back to childhood trauma. So, you know, I think that's a, it's an important point that you made. Correct. Good. Thank you. Now, Sarah, what, what strategies can parents implement to preserve the marriage? There are so many strategies that one can implement to preserve the marriage. I, I think first and foremost, go out and learn the tools of how to actually have conflicts in in a non-destructive manner. So that's number one, uh, high on the list. The other thing is they should seek a professional. They should look to work with a professional, a marriage therapist, a marriage coach who is keen on maintaining marriages and is values marriages and, and helping couples achieving a good marriage. And then, of course, there are some things they can, they can do as part of new things they learn about what it makes for a good marriage, and that's creating we time. It's very important for a couple to have time for themselves together. I believe a couple needs to spend at least 20 to 30 minutes a day just sharing what the day was like with each other. And by the way, this is very valuable for children. It's, it's healthy for children to see that the parents value their own unit. That means within the marriage, within the family unit, it's very healthy for children to see parents having their own we time. And then there's the other thing. Of, there's the saying, curiosity killed the cat. But I would say, curiosity killed the cat, but it will not kill your marriage. Be curious about each other. Really get to know each other, the likes, the dislikes, your hobbies, your concerns, your worries, etc. And the reason that's important is because knowledge is power. And if you will really get to know your spouse, their current stresses, etc., then you will know how to better treat each other. So there's, you know, the list goes on and on, but there's many, many things that make for good marriage and a lot of tools that you can learn. Another big one is sharing appreciations and admirations with one another. So basically making sure on a daily basis to thank your spouse, because at the end of the day, you are better off in life because of your spouse. Your spouse is enabling you in many ways to have a good quality life. So take the time to express that and share that with your spouse. In a previous conversation, you also mentioned addressing unresolved trauma or unresolved pain. Can you expound on that just a little bit? That's actually a big one. Very often, even if we take the time to educate ourselves on what makes for a good marriage, we get stuck. And what I found when working with couples, and and we learned that a lot in the different marriage modalities, is that the reason we get stuck is because there's some unresolved pain and hurt, which must be resolved. So we can think about it, it's like if we eat a food that we didn't take well to and we have an upset stomach so it's not metabolized correctly well you can't metabolize the new tools if there's something wrong if there's something bothering you so one of the things i teach couples is what we call the aftermath of the fight is an intervention it's a gottman modality intervention and that's a way for couples to learn how to dig deep and talk about pain or trauma that's really bothering the person, bringing that to the surface, talking about it in a healthy way, and that helps one overcome that. I mean, isn't unresolved pain, unresolved trauma, that's really like when we talk about baggage or there's just too much baggage in a relationship, that's really, we're just an excuse for not dealing with things. Well, unresolved pain and trauma can be either related to something not within the current relationship, but that kind of resurfaces because your spouse is reminding you of something when when they behave in a certain manner. So actually the Imago modality talks a lot about the 90-10 principle, 90% of why your spouse is upset about certain things that you're doing or not doing is because of some childhood memories that this is bringing to the surface in them, some pain from childhood. And 10% has actually to do with the spouse. And when you dialogue about this, whether you're using, utilizing a Gottman aftermath of the fight uh, intervention or util- utilizing an Imago dialogue, intervention. That is a very healthy way for bringing up why a person is bothered by something or what that trauma actually is, making the spouse aware of it, talking about it. Very often, you know, the person will cry and dig deep and realize there's something to do with a childhood or something to do with a previous relationship, etc. So just the fact that one is aware that it has nothing to do with me, that my spouse is behaving like this or is sensitive to a certain manner, already appeases a lot of the, the, the strife and is healing to both the spouse that's hurting and the spouse that's finding out where that hurt is really coming from. 
90% comes from previous traumas. That's a, that's a shocking number, but it, it makes a lot of sense. Yes. What, what, and that's uh, imago, the imago modalities established by Harville Hendricks and Miss Hunt, actually. And basically, what they found was that 90% of what's, you know, what we react to and what we feel has nothing to do with our spouse. It has to do with some previous hurt and pain. And even if a couple does end up getting divorced, there's a lot of transference there. And then that other parent can become the target of all that hurt, anguish, anger from all these previous traumas. And now that all gets targeted, manifested towards that. Towards yeah, their- well, well, and the transference actually, uh, if they'll trace it back, will probably have something to do with the childhood pain. Even though it's like they're tracing it to a previous relationship, but if they'll take the time to trace it, they'll realize they, they went wrong in the previous relationship all because, again, it's childhood exactly, trauma. Exactly. Interesting. Which, which yeah. again, makes this a great book. It's first is because we have to realize how much, how growing up and being a child really impacts the rest of our life and why we should be very keen on maintaining good and healthy marriages and home environments for our children. So I'd like to tell you about a book that I think you really enjoy reading. It's called The Putting Kids First in Divorce Book. And it's a number one best-selling book now available on Amazon. You can either go to Amazon.com and search Putting Kids First in Divorce or go to the DivorceBuddy.co website. We discuss and go into a lot of detail on all of the different things that we cover on this show, including how to preserve relationships and protect children during and after the divorce. And we bring together 11 leading divorce co-parenting and relationships relationship professionals who all share their insights and perspectives on communication, conflict resolution, and supporting children through a transition. So you'll learn about alternatives to litigation, such as collaborative law, mediation, and divorce coaching, which of course are far less adversarial and more economical than family court. It's a really easy to read interview format style book. Again, putting kids first in divorce. It'll enlighten, empower, and inspire you. So again, support the podcast, and we hope you enjoy the book. So just visit Amazon.com, search on Putting Kids First in Divorce, or you can go to the DivorceBuddy.co website, and under Resources, we have a whole list of different books that you might find helpful. I just wonder, do you have any suggestions on how parents can insulate their children from from this inevitable conflict and really provide healthy modeling? I love this question, Jeremy. And first, I must say that the part of the question I'm loving is the fact that inevitable conflict. Conflict indeed is inevitable, but combat is a choice. And that's not a choice that one should ever take. We must create boundaries. That means that we should never have any conflict in front of our children. Go into an office, go into your room if you need to. And of course, I can go very deep into this conversation, but I won't want to take the time now to really state that in conflict, we must learn how to manage a conflict, which will include many rules, many things that you must eliminate, like threats. Threat would be I'm leaving the relationship or yelling, or violence, of course, or raising other issues, name calling, etc. These are things that we can never, never do even when we're having the conversation in private. So again, the question is not if we will have conflict, but how to deal with it. And there are ways to learn, ways to learn that. But the first thing they need to do is, of course, not have any conflicts in front of the children. The other thing that I actually like to teach a couple right from the onset is that even if your spouse is not behaving in the right way, so say, you know, they're attending a couple of sessions and they come in on the next session, they say, you know, we did everything right. But, you know, this week my husband has decided to come in and yell at me uh, for not having dinner at time, whatever. And so I got so upset. So I started yelling back at him. And I always explain to a spouse that that especially when the children are around, but even if the children are not around, never ever react just because your, your, your spouse is acting. So I have them imagine an invisible space between their partner's action and their reaction. And that space is called choice. You have a choice of how you will react. So even if your spouse is going off on you and screaming and yelling, just take a deep breath and don't get sucked into a fight and argument, specifically again, if you are in front of the children. So the greatest gift that we can give our children is modeling to them what a healthy, loving, caring relationship looks like. And again, uh, if we do that, then of course the children will know how to behave in their marriage. And one of them is not have any conflicts uh, in front of them. And a great point that you made, I like how you said clearly conflict is inevitable, but it's conflict versus combat. And combat is, that's a, that's a choice. And that's a choice that we should never make. There's other healthier ways to manage the conflict and deal with conflict. Correct. 
And what are some things that we can learn as parents, as adults from our children? You know, they say from the mouth of babes, there's a lot that we can learn from children. And what you'll find is children are very blunt. They're not busy with their ego. And we can see that, you know, when we observe kindergarten children, if anybody's teaching kindergarten children or even watching their children play with their playmates at the age of two, three, etc. And what you'll see is if they want to be someone's friend, they'll just go over and say, can you please be my friend? Uh, as adults, we, we were shy. We're busy with the ego. We wouldn't do that. So we, we tend to not ask for what we want simply by just stating that. And I'll give you an example. Um, I'll take an example from something that happened with my own two and a half year old grandchild. I was walking my daughter to the door after a brief visit. She made an impromptu visit to my house. My two and a half year old was in the carriage. And as I walked her to the door, I gave her a kiss and I said, you know, goodbye, have a great day. And my little cute two and a half year old grandson piped up and said, me too, grandma, me too, grandma. And he just gestured to his cheek and he said, kiss, kiss. He wanted a kiss too. And of course, I smothered him with kisses. As I walked away, I said to myself, wow, look at that. He really embodied what I teach couples, and that is say what you mean, mean what you say, and don't say it in a mean way. Just simply state, like he said, Grandma, I'd like to have a kiss, and he got that. So instead of us stating in a negative manner what we're not getting, so for example, you never help me with the dishes, simply say, I would love for you to help me with the dishes. And doing things in this manner will actually help couples get uh, what they want from one another. That is great advice. And I don't know why we forget it from when we, when we were kids, but there's so many times is we're not going to say what we mean or even worse, we don't communicate anything at all and just sort of withdraw or suppress that. And then it just kind of bubbles up and we never deal with the issues. Either we don't express it or what actually really happens most often is we express a need in a negative manner. So I'm so upset you don't take the garbage. I've reminded you 10 times and or I'm really upset you're late, you know, you're, you're late again, etc. Instead of saying, honey, it would mean so much for me if uh, you come home on time. And if you don't, can you kindly call me next time just to let me know? You know, so just simply state what you need. Right. And I like how you express it in, in a positive instead of it's not, exactly. a, it's not an angry way. It's a positive. Exactly. Great advice. Now, obviously, you know, the theme of this particular podcast is really about making it work. And when a couple is, is going through extended conflict and, and they are really considering divorce, but they, but their ultimate goal, they prefer to preserve the marriage and make it work. And that, that situation, I think even it's even more important, really finding the right therapist. And I wonder if you could perhaps provide a couple tips, you know, two or three tips on how to find the right therapist. This is a great question. What I find is I'm usually like a last stop somehow when couples come to me. I find that they've been to so many therapists prior to seeing me. And so I began really digging and finding out, you know, what really went wrong. So I think the most important advice I can give to the readers and listeners is you need to make sure that the therapist you will see is somebody who's trained in marriage counseling modality. So whether you're seeing a therapist or coach, it doesn't matter, but they must be trained in marriage counseling. So again, it doesn't matter if therapist or coach has some letters after their name. That wouldn't mean much. Letters meaning, you know, the MSW, the CSW, PhD, etc. If they were not trained in specific marriage modalities and some of the popular ones out there are Imago, Gottman, and Michelle Wiener Davis has great work. She's internationally, again, renowned expert and director of the Divorce Busting Center in Colorado. So make sure that they're trained and really know the work. The other thing I would say is you need to see a marriage counselor who takes an holistic approach and basically is family oriented and doesn't view you as an individual, but sees you as part of a whole, a whole meaning you are part of your spouse, your children, and, and really, you know, takes all these different people into consideration when working with you. Because very often I will see one person who comes to me, you know, one marriage partner and the spouse is not yet ready to see me. So I keep in mind that there is, that there are other people in the picture. So if there are children involved, I keep the children in mind. And when there's a spouse involved, of course, then I continue doing my work, having that holistic approach. And that's something that clients should really find out from their prospective coach or therapist they'll be working with. And the other thing I, I'm very keen on, on sharing insight about is the fact that very often therapists or coaches will encourage one of the spouses to see another therapist for their individual work. I find that that can be very detrimental because that individual therapist might have an entire different method or derail the spouse from the marriage work that they're doing in the couple's 
therapy. I do want to say that, though, with one exception, and that is when it comes to addictions, addiction is a very specific modality. So the spouse, uh, one of the spouses might need to see an addiction therapist, whether it's a sex addiction or a gambling addiction, et cetera, et cetera. I believe that that will not derail the spouse because, again, that's very specific therapy. And that's a good enhancement to the couple's work that they're doing. That's a great point. It is highly specialized. But I do wonder, what do you suggest? Because obviously, I mean, there's, you have the dynamic of the relationship. And, and so you're dealing with that in the context of a therapist that you share. But there's going to be certain things that perhaps the husband or the wife, they just want to talk to somebody and kind of get things off their chest. And it may or may not be appropriate to see with their primary therapist. Do you suggest like a support group or are there other things or, or what do you recommend in that situation? Honestly, what I recommend is that they do individual work with the same counselor or coach that they're doing in the marriage. So I, for example, I see clients, sometimes I'll see both the husband and wife individually outside of our couple's work because... I think that the marriage counselor or therapist working with a couple has the most and best insight to what the individual work might be and how they can best help that person individually. So, and again, which will enhance the person and the couple in the marriage. So I strongly believe that sometimes, and actually very often it is the case where one or both need to have some individual work done, but let it be that same marriage counselor or coach. I I think that that's keeping it within, within the realm of the work being done as a couple and not being diverted uh, by other advice or misled, et cetera. Now, that's a great point. And I think a lot of people don't really realize that there are therapists that are open to that, where you can have the couple's dynamic and then each of you can do some individual work with that same therapist. But again, I think that you bring up some very valid points in terms of if you, if you each go to different therapists outside of the couple's therapist, you've got three different viewpoints here and you could have a lot of conflicting messages being carried to your relationship that could really potentially create more conflict and not do anything in terms of moving towards resolving or managing that conflict. That's very correct. Where you know, the popular saying of too many cooks spoil the broth. And boy, I've seen that happen. And that's why I'm very keen on making sure we keep it as as tight as we can in terms of how many therapists you're seeing and what's going on. Yeah, that's great advice. Well, thanks, Sarah, so much. Really appreciate having you on. You know, just in conclusion, you know, how do, how do people learn more about you and get in touch with you to hire you or just learn more about your different modalities and, and philosophies? The best way is for people to go to my website. That's www.sarahfried.com. S-A-R-A-F-R-E-E-D.com. I do offer a free 30-minute consultation, so feel free to take advantage of that. I also have a great report, which actually will be going on my website this coming week. And that's the five secrets to bring peace and happiness to your marriage. Great content there. So feel free to download that. Thanks so much, Sarah. Really appreciate having you on the call today. Thank you. Have a great day, Jeremy. Thank you so much for joining us on the DivorceBuddy.co's Kids First Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to us on Stitcher and iTunes, and don't forget to visit DivorceBuddy.co for further resources, including podcasts, show notes, tips, blogs, and discounts on soon-to-be-released online courses. And remember, as Karen Bonnell, author of the Co-Parents Handbook, is fond of saying, when it comes to a child's sense of family, what divorce breaks apart, solid co-parenting rebuilds. You'll never regret taking the high road and resolving conflict and putting your kids first. I'm Jeremy Cosson. Thank you for listening.